All right. Thank you so much, Dan and Seth. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking around. And welcome to this introduction to mobile development. My name is Nitya Narsimhan. I'm a senior cloud advocate on the developer relations team at Microsoft. Um, this is the accompanying learn module. You can also find it on the website. And I'll put a link to it later at the end. But if you want to go check out some mobile development after this, feel free to go there. Also, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you're interested in following up on some of the things we'll talk about today, go check out that AKMS link at the bottom. So it's ak.ms slash intro hyphen to hyphen mobile hyphen dev. I'll be putting all the slides and the content that comes in this talk over there. And I'd love to hear from you to see how, you're, how you progress. You can also find me at Nithya on Twitter. So quick introduction to me. We're all talking about journeys today, right? So your journey is important. And I've been in the mobile space for a long time. I started out in research actually over two decades ago. And at that time, mobile was just emerging. I was working in Motorola Labs. And what really made me fascinated with mobile was this kind of notion of seamless mobility. We looked at the phone and said, this is the one thing the user carries with them everywhere they go. It provides context. It provides identity. It helps us create these seamless experiences as they go from home to car to, to uh, play. Fast forward a few years, and I started working with startups and as a consultant, building these things, but not as prototypes, rather as products to scale. And I realized that when we think about mobile experiences, we also need to think about mobile web apps and cross-platform apps. The first one allows you to kind of ship across all the different platforms there are. The second one allows you to use a single code base and build targeted apps for both Android and iOS and other destinations. And last but not least, I'm an advocate on the cloud, um, on the Microsoft Developer Relations team. But I've also kind of been an advocate for the longest time in community. And what I'm really excited about right now is dual screen foldables. If we have time, we'll go look into that later. And let's talk about your journey today. The roadmap for the stock actually is in three parts. First, we're going to set the stage. Why should you care about mobile? You've heard so much today. Why mobile? Second, and we'll spend the bulk of our time here, we're going to talk about how you can get started building your very first app in Android, something really simple. We're not going to be able to build everything, obviously, but what you'll achieve is two things. Hopefully, you will learn to get your development environment set up, and you'll learn what the workflow looks like. Last but not least, to continue your journey, I'll share some resources. So let's get started on the first and most important question, why should you care? So I have some stats for you. The first motivation for you should be the fact that mobile app usage is growing. It's growing 10% year over year, and it's been 35% since 2017. And it's being driven by the fact that we are all addicted to our phones. A mobile user spends over three and a half hours on their phone every day. That's not going away. Great, that's awesome. But what about as a developer? Like, is there, is there room for me? It turns out, and for each one of these, I'll share the slides later. The links are at the bottom so you can check out the bigger reports. If you look at the job market, it turns out that in the mobile app space, um, they're kind of predicting that mobile app developer jobs will grow 30% over the next decade. And in that space, you'll see the Java and Android tend to be at the top. We'll look at why in just a minute. But you can also look at the GitHub Octoverse report on the right side, and it shows that the fastest programming languages that are being learned or skilled up by developers today, in those, the first one, Dart, and the fourth one, Kotlin, both target the mobile ecosystem. So you can't go around picking up a new skill here. So where should you start? Well, there are actually two dominant mobile operating systems out there. There's Android and iOS. And if you look at the stats, mobile OS market share actually favors Android. 85% of smartphones shipped worldwide tend to work with Android. And that's because Android has a broader device ecosystem and also targets various kinds of um, ecosystems from like 5G all the way to like developing nations. But last but not least, if at this point you're like, I bought in, but what can I build? It turns out there are five different areas where you're seeing a lot of growth in mobile. Gaming, of course, mobile banking, mobile retail, all your Thanksgiving purchases are likely going through that phone, video streaming, hopefully you're watching this on a mobile right now, and social, everything from TikTok to Twitter. But what's interesting is COVID is changing a lot of behavior. So now we're actually doing more on our phone. And what could be interesting is new behaviors and how we would support that. So what are your options? I can't go into all of them because there's so much I want to talk about, but I'm going to hugely recommend you follow through and watch this talk from my colleague, Brandon Minnick. 
It's called Choosing the Best Mobile Framework, and he just gave this talk in, uh, at NDC. But if you kind of want to get the big picture, you can think of mobile app development options falling into three buckets. You can build native apps. So you can build an app for a specific target platform using their tools. So the Android SDK for Android or the iOS SDK for iOS. What you get is the best tooling, the latest features and everything you need, but you'll be targeting one market. Or you can look for cross-platform. Cross-platform is where you've got kind of another layer above where you can now write with one code base, but you have tooling that helps you build those apps for multiple markets. There are trade-offs, of course. And last but not least, there's mobile web apps. Progressive web apps is a space where they're trying to kind of figure out how can they make a web app look and perform close to native expectations. Things like having offline access, things like having an icon on the home screen. So you can explore that too. And this table also tells you what languages tend to dominate in those spaces. But that all doesn't matter, right? I really, if you take one message away from mobile development, know this, that ecosystem is huge. So your philosophy has to be, how do you eat an elephant? And this is a meme I know, but I kind of like it because what it really is saying is when you have a giant endeavor in front of you, start by taking one bite at a time. Start with a single step, take time to learn the core idea behind it, Step, wait for a second and just enjoy that achievement, pick your next step and go again. And my real hope is that your first small bite of this Android elephant today will be where you will go check these slides later and try to build your first, install the SDK and build your first app. From a broader perspective though, I also wanna give you some options. When you think about how you go from your having your first idea to actually building it, there is a kind of a roadmap. Let's first ask the question, do you just have an idea? You don't have anything else. You just have this idea and you're thinking, how could I do it? Then start with design. You can look at wireframing tools and design systems. Just figure out how to put the, the UI flows together and what you need. But what if you're one of those folks who's working at a company, you have data and you wanna do something to improve the user experience. Then the next step is to kind of look at just drag and drop solutions. You don't need to learn to code if you can use platforms like Power Platform drag and drop solutions with data connectors that let you bring your data into that system. Definitely check out the full day of Power Platform programming tomorrow. But last but not least, this is where you really need to learn mobile development. You actually wanna do new things, better things, new features, high performance. And that's where you need to know the development SDKs, toolkits, and design patterns. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna try to get you through a speed review of building your first very simple Android app. And after you hear this, I hope you'll go and try to do it yourself. I'm gonna put all these slides and the videos that go with them at that post that you see there. So what we wanna to do today is build a very simple Android app. And what it's gonna do is, this is a, a, an icon, an image from the wonderful Ashley McNamara that features our developer advocate bit. So at the end of this, Hopefully what you'll have is a single screen app that shows hello world, but with bit. What you're seeing on the left is what Android Studio looks like. That is the preferred IDE. So what are the steps for this demo? We're gonna walk through a few things and wherever possible, I'm gonna have like, you know, uh, I've recorded some snippets that you can see how that actually works on Android Studio. And then we'll talk about a couple of things in there. First thing, is I'm assuming that you will install Android Studio later. I already have that on my machine. That is the default development environment for Android. Second, you're gonna click the create new project wizard and build a basic Android app. Third, all right, you've gone through that boil plate and just got a hello world app, but how do you know it works? You're gonna create a new Android virtual device. That will help you set up something called an emulator so that you can test out your app on a virtual device right there on your desktop without needing to have access to the real Android devices for your app. Next, you'll update that boilerplate code to do a couple of small things. In this case, we're gonna to try to update the simple hello world to show the bit icon. And then last, we're gonna look at a few things around how you could fix warnings and then run the updated app and don't forget to celebrate. So step one, Android Studio IDE. This is what it looks like when you install it. It's the preferred ID for Android. And I just want to point you to a couple of things that will come in handy. First, its build system is based on Gradle. 
It's customizable. It's a plugin based system that lets you customize the entire process from building to testing to deploying, obfuscating code, et cetera. Second, there's an AVD manager built in. You can create virtual devices for as many Android targets as you want, from phones and wearables, TVs, you name it. There's an SDK manager. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But think that with Android, there are so many versions in the past. An SDK manager not only allows you to kind of target your app at older and newer versions, it allows you to update your tools and your um, SDKs seamlessly. Last but not least, none of this would work if you didn't have visual design tools, profiling tools, debugging tools, and lots more. All of that is in Android Studio. Every one of these slides will have a link at the bottom with a resource that will show you where you can learn more about all of this. So here, let's walk through our first demo. So this one, I'm actually going to play and then kind of pause it and skip through the various things because I don't want to waste too much time. But the SDK manager, when you finish installing Android Studio, it's probably the first step that you will take. And what it does is it allows you to install various SDKs. So you can see there that the option is under configure. And when you click on that, you'll get to this SDK manager page. And it shows you every single version of Android that exists, the images for those, the system images for those. And those will come in handy even when you're trying to emulate and run your app. So you can test against the actual image. Android goes back quite a few years. I tend to just install the latest and greatest and perhaps one older um, version. But you can do what you need. So simply go ahead, select. And those are the other tabs that show you what other up updates you can get. So simply just select the version that you want to install. And click the button. Let's go with, I think I did Nougat. Yep. Mm, yep. And then install it. And within seconds, you should be done. So while this is finishing up, let me kind of focus on the image on the right. Why does this matter? Those are all the Android versions since ever. So early Android versions were named after pastries. You might have heard of Lollipop and Marshmallow, right? More recent ones are given numbers. So we're at Android 11 right now. But there are two reasons why you would pick the API level and platform version. The first one is kind of like when you want to figure out how many, what's the size of the device population your app can be installed on. So if you look at this, you'll see that every device out there today, every Android device doesn't run the latest and greatest Android, right? Not everyone updates. Not everyone has the kind of device that can take the latest updates. This lets you kind of look at it. The data is real time, gives you a sense of what percentage of devices in the open market across all Android devices can I target by picking a particular API level and platform version. So you usually use that to pick the broadest range. What you might also do is pick it to narrow it down because every one of these API levels is adding new features, which may or may not be supported in the older ones. So if you have a feature dependency, for example, I'm doing stuff with foldables, which came about in Android 10. Therefore, I tend to try to work with those devices first, then that might be your use case. So that was installing the SDK. Next, once you've done that, just literally go up and open the Create New Project Wizard and walk through building your first boilerplate app. I'm going to take a second to showcase the different templates that are available. You'll see two things. First of all, you'll see that there are tabs, one for every device form factor. So you have templates for phone and tablets, for wearables, for TV, automotive, and IoT devices. Android works across them all. In each of these, you'll see what's called an activity template. In Android parlance, an activity is the screen. It's the view that you see. So what you're getting is a boilerplate app that automatically has done the basics needed for that kind of screen. And it kind of covers the basics, right? You'll see a map view. So if, you, if you've got an app that has a map screen, maybe that's where you start. Or a, a master detail flow is usually for when you have a collection. We're going to call it list detail, a collection and detail views for each individual item, and so on. So definitely go check those out. Here's the demo of what that looks like. So when you start, you go ahead and just select a start a new Android project. Let's skip ahead. So when you get to this, I'm going to walk through. And yeah, so let's get to the main part. So we're going to pick the empty activity today for the demo. When you pick the empty activity, you get to this screen. And I'm going to wait for a second, and we'll talk briefly about it. You're going to do two things on this. First, you're going to pick the name for your app. That's the name that's going to show up on the icon when you install the app on your phone. Can be something descriptive, something unique to you. The second is the package name. And the package name is what gets attached along with the name to make your app unique in the Play Store or in the market or on the device. 
right? So for example, if I decided to write hello world as the name of my app, there's likely to be a lot of people writing hello worlds that are different from mine. By scoping it to a unique package name, you've got yourself a unique application instance. Last but not least, uh, you'll see that the language here, and let's play this again, the language options under here are Kotlin and Java. If you're starting for a first time in mobile development, pick Kotlin. Android is going Kotlin first. But if you're familiar with Java, definitely go and go with that. Either of those is perfectly fine for your initial app. Um, click Finish, and this is what you get. It's scaffolded out a very simple app. And what we're going to look at here is what you see on the left side. So you can see that the drop-down menu allows you to see your code base in various perspectives. If you put it in project mode, you're actually going to see how it is on the file system. But most developers will keep it in Android mode, where they can actually look at it from the view that's most optimal for a developer, as you can see here. And in here, you're going to see that there are top level four different areas. And we'll talk about that briefly later, but I want you to just keep that in mind. There is manifest, Java, RES or resources, and Gradle. In RES, look at the activity underscore main file. So I'm going to just stop this for a second and flip through the two slides that you, two screens that you see. First one is when you look at main activity, that's in the Java folder, that is your source for the app. Currently, this one is written in Kotlin. And if you look at this, this is the entry point. It's just like main in any other language. So main activity is the entry point. And all it's saying is, hey, when I'm created, please go ahead. Oops, I moved it. I should not have done that. Give me a second. All right, we'll use this. All it's saying is, set my content view to r.layout.activity main. That activity main kind of looks familiar, doesn't it? Because when we looked at it, under the resource file, there's an activity underscore main.xml. So first thing you're going to need to know about the Android programming language. There is the source code in Kotlin or Java that is going to be written to control the life cycle of the activity. But the UI itself can be designed and written in XML and stored under resources. And this is what it looks like. And you'll see it's literally just a simple hello world text view, right? So let's keep going. If you look at the Android manifest, we already looked at what the source looked like, just had a simple method that inflated the view. We saw what the view looked like. We're going to look into more detail on that in just a minute. But now let's see what the manifest is. The manifest is a packing slip for your app. It's the place where you're going to define for both the Play Store and for the installer what kinds of components your app has. Remember that term components because we're going to talk about that later. And last but not least, resources are the non-code assets that get packaged along with your app. So when you've got this far, you've got everything. Um, you haven't made a single line of code change. You've scaffolded out a default app. Let's see what that looks like. How can we do that? We can run it on an emulator. So I'm going to first show you what it looks like running on an emulator, and then we'll talk about how you can create one. So all you would do is go into the top of your Android Studio, pick the device that you want the, to kind of try this out on. You can have different emulators for different form factors. So you can have a tablet device, you can have a phone, et cetera, run your app. And then as you can see here, the emulator when it launches looks exactly like a real device and shows you what that app looks like. And in, in this case, it's just a simple hello world, single string, done, right? So when you're trying this out on your own, what I want you to do is explore. Take this little bite of Android elephant and try out the different templates. Can you recognize patterns for apps that you've seen on your phone? Play with it. There's no, you can't do any harm. Just play with it. So after that, the next step is to create that AVD. Remember when we ran the demo, the default demo, you were able to see it on a real device, right? How do you create one of those? So AVD stands for Android Virtual Device. And what it is, is it, it models the characteristics of a real Android device. So if you don't own one, you can still do this. And it can have emulator skins that look and feel like that instance of the device. So when you actually take screenshots or when you see it, it feels real. Last but not least, configuration properties let you set up what the device state should be and what kinds of behaviors it should show the way you would do on a real device. So I'm going to skip the video for it. When I put the slides up, please check out the blog post. I'll put the video there. But basically, you'd go into the configure screen and you'd be able to set up and create your own device. What I do want you to try to explore here is try creating AVDs for other categories. I've created one for a phone, but try creating for wearables and TVs. You might need to download new system images. So you might need to then flip back to the SDK manager and install a new 
SDK. Great. Let's now review the boilerplate code and let's talk about what you can do next. So we reviewed the following things. In your code, this is basically the source for your app, the manifest, the think packing slip for your device, the source, the Java folder that contains Kotlin or Java code, which is really the components for processing, resources, non-code assets that are going to be packaged with your app. So you can think about this, not just layouts in XML, but images, fonts, um, colors, strings. I'll talk briefly about things like strings. Why are they a resource? Because now you can do things like localization by putting alternative versions of strings in that um, resource. And that way you don't need to go back and change your code. It can automatically pick up the right localized versions of the string values for you. So you can do things like that. And last but not least, Gradle scripts. So this is where we are at, right? Let's review core concepts, and then we'll dive into the stage of making some changes in that code. So here, here are the core concepts for Android. Your programming language is Kotlin or Java. Your package, or APK, is a compiled code and resources. Every app runs in its own secure VM, so you can't kind of like you know sneak peeks at other people's data. Think of it almost, it's a Linux system under the cover, so every app is like a unique user. And if you remember just one thing about Android, remember that Android code has four kinds of components. Activities, which are the views. Services, which are background processing. Broadcast receivers, which is code that you can use to kind of receive asynchronous events. And content providers to help you access and work with data. How do you communicate between these components? There is something called intents. An intent can be implicit or explicit. It's literally like every app is sending a message to every other app, right? Saying, hey, I need someone who can do a map view for me. Do you have a map view? And if Google Maps is installed on your phone, it's going to get up and be like, I can do it. And now you don't have to write the map view. You can literally take advantage of the fact that Google Maps is installed, right? And if Bing Maps is installed tomorrow, that can wake up and say, I can do it too. And now you have a choice. So implicit intents are when you do messaging by telling you the type of um, target you want. And every instance that satisfies it is able to like be a possible target. Explicit intents is when you directly message a specific instance. So app manifest we talked about, and I'm going to go quickly because we have just a few minutes left. To edit the boilerplate, what we really want to do is we want to kind of add a new drawable resource, that image that you see, change the design layout so that we can have a new component, a new view, and then fix the warnings. So I'm going to let you watch this later, but let's quickly go through what the steps are. And then I'll walk through a few things and then wrap up. So when you want to make changes to the default app, the first thing you're going to do is go into the XML for the layout. So as you can see, the XML for the layout activity doesn't currently have an image view. So what you're going to do is you're going to go in and you're going to click on tools and import a resource. Give me a second. There. So if you click on tools, you see this is resource manager. An image is a non-code asset. So you want to put that into the resource. And when you do that, you get a helper that walks you through the process of adding an image. The minute you add that image into your code, it's now going to show up in your resources directory as one of the drawable resources. Now, all you need to do is flip into the activity main, into the design view. And now you can drag and drop an image view over which is what we're going to do. I actually moved the text view up a little bit, flipped the fonts, did a bunch of pretty stuff. But then I can import that view, put an image view in, point it to this new image. And now I've added that right in. Again, no code, literally dragged and dropped it using the design view. And I've got that working. So if I were to kind of walk through this, you'll see at the end that that's kind of work. OK, you'll see at the end that this is the code behind it. It's now taken my drag and drop design editor and converted it into attributes that are now being able, that will be, um, that'll allow me to define that layout. That's all you need to do. You're done. When you kind of then go ahead and play this, you will now be able to deploy this updated app directly to your emulator and see it online. So you can see that behind there. So in the interest of time, I'm going to roll through quickly. I'll put the video on. You can see it. But I'll also put the resources on. And there are a bunch of other files that you can use. So I hope you try to make your own version of Hello Bitworld. But if you got this far, hopefully, if you replicated this, you would have installed Android Studio. 
used the boilerplate code to build a very simple app, created an emulator so you can test it, and then made a few changes to change the view. Beyond this, you need to scale up and do other stuff. So where can you go next? First, you need to know Kotlin. One of the reasons I didn't go too much into the code base of this is Kotlin is a fairly new language. But the great thing is there's a ton of good resources for you to learn. So go to the Kotlin language fundamental site. There's a lot of places for you to go check that out. Next, go to the Android developer site. You can get development guides that will walk you through different features. So how do I send notifications? How do I handle events? How do I create something for a background service? And so on. Then you can think about adding cloud and AI backends. We maintain a really amazing Azure for Mobile Developers page where you can find out examples of how you can do this for Xamarin. Keep an eye out for Android and Kotlin examples coming up soon. And I would be very remiss if I didn't end with the reason why I started doing this in the first place. Why is Microsoft talking about Android? Because, hello, we just launched the Surface Duo. This is one of my favorite devices right now. The Surface Duo is a dual screen multi posture device. It's thin and it's one of the new category of foldable devices that has productivity in mind. So you have both M365 apps and the Android Play Store. What can you do with it? Foldables is a now category in Android, but with the Duo, you have not only the ability to have multiple postures, so you can do different things based on the angle of the, the screen, but you have two screens. So rather than just have a single app on one screen as in phone mode, and then have a different device for tablet, you can effectively fold this out for a broader immersive span layer or run it on either screen. The combination of this dual screen and multi posture is going to unlock a huge number of capabilities for our devices. So if you're interested in that, here's Hello Bit World running without a change on the Duo. And there's a whole bunch of code samples for Android Kotlin that you can use to get started. And with that, I just want to thank you very much. Don't forget, go check out the AKMS link. Here's a recap of what we covered, setting the stage, building your first app, and places where you can continue your journey. And I hope you will tag me at Nithya and show me your screenshots. Thank you.